Well, howdy there. Good to see you all. The message I'm about to preach may be the most important message I have ever shared in my entire life. Now, how's that for an opening line? But I believe that it is completely true. You see, we've been studying this story from the Old Testament about how God's people were in bondage, and God raised up this deliverer named Moses to lead them out so they could be free. And the truth is, the teaching of Scripture is that we're all enslaved to sin. And by that, I don't just mean sins like lying or adultery or stealing something. When I say we're enslaved to sin, what I'm talking about is that principle, that principle of sin that operates in us, you and me, and incarcerates us and keeps us from being what God designed us to be. Now, if we're honest, Uh, we're kind of like the Apostle Paul. He describes his own situation in Romans chapter seven. Here's what he said about himself. Now, Now, this is a giant of the faith. He's talking about himself. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Paul says, look, it's like gravity, man. It's like gravity. This this sin principle in me, it just, it just doesn't go away. It keeps dragging me down. Now, I know that's true of me. I'll bet it's true of you. I see a few halos out there today, but not many of you have that. The truth is, sin is a ruthless taskmaster. Uh, listen to what Jesus himself said about Sin. He said, for from within, this is Jesus talking, out of the heart, men's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Jesus, our world is full of these things, but where do they really come from? All these evils come from inside and they make a person unclean. According to Jesus, we're all broken on the inside. I am, you are, and just as God, here's the story, just as he wanted to redeem Israel long ago, his people, so he wants to redeem us from our bondage to sin. And so all throughout the Bible, this deliverance from Egypt that we've been studying now for a number of weeks It's a portrayal, it's a powerful symbol of deliverance from sin. And God accomplished that in the most amazing way through the death of a lamb. Now, oh, oh, that's such a strange story to modern ears, isn't it? It sounds like gruesome, it sounds weird. There's this disconnect with modern sensibilities. I get it. I live in this world too. But I want to explore that story with you today because the applications to us are so important. They're as important as anything we can learn. And that's why I said this message that I'm about to preach may be the most important message I've ever preached. And I believe that's true. Not because it's touchy feely, not because it's entertaining but because of the content and the truth contained in it. So let's dive in. I want to consider, first of all, this final plague and the preparation for the Passover. Now, if you've been with us, you know that, or if you've read the story on your own, you know there's a whole bunch of plagues that God designed as attacks on the gods, little g, the gods of Egypt. And this last one is no exception. So let's read a little bit. It's a very interesting passage from Exodus chapter 12 here. And there's so much around this. I invite you to read the whole thing when you get a moment today. But God is giving instructions about how they're supposed to slay this lamb 
and then eat this, what later came to be called as a Passover meal. So let's dive into the middle of it. Then they, that is the people, are to take some of the blood, the blood of the lamb, and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. In other words, you, you just take care of your own house, you apply the blood to the door frames. That same night, they're to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, God goes on here, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods, little g, of Egypt. I am the Lord, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. In other words, you'll be safe if the blood there is applied, you will be safe, okay? No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now, we've said before that these plagues were really a judgment on the gods of Egypt. And this last one is certainly no different. But scholars scratch their heads here. If you read commentaries from this section, uh, scholars are wondering exactly which God is being addressed because Israel had over 700 of them. Over 700 gods. That's weird to me growing up as I did with a Judeo-Christian worldview. One God, it's hard for to imagine having 700 that are ruling your life. But they believe that these gods, very polytheistic, they believe these gods affected everything from the Nile River itself to the fertility uh, of their families, to the weather, to their health, to their crops, their animals. In, uh, in fact, there were a lot of gods, they believe, that were in the form of animals. There was one god in the form of a frog, another one in the form of a cow. And so scholars wonder, exactly which God does this last plague apply to? Well, I would suggest it applies to the system of the pharaohs that is under attack. You see, the pharaohs were considered divine. They were considered gods. They were considered deities. So, the firstborn of the Pharaoh dies, that means the future deity, the heir to the throne is actually dying. We read here in Exodus, every firstborn son in Egypt will die from the firstborn son of the Pharaoh. Now, that's the future deity. The firstborn son of the Pharaoh is gonna be the next Pharaoh. The future deity who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the slave girl. So clearly, this plague is impacting every facet of society and, and the culture of Egypt. And when the Israelites left, they were literally marching out while funeral ceremonies are taking place. And all over Egypt, everyone knew that God Almighty had brought judgment on their gods. By the way, in the book called Numbers in your Bible, it makes this explicitly clear in Numbers 33. The Israelites set out from Ramses on the 15th day of the first month, the day after the Passover. They marched out boldly in full view of the Egyptians who were burying all their firstborn, whom the Lord had struck down among them, for the Lord had brought judgment on their gods. So Israel walks out that day and and they knew one thing for sure, whatever power they might have imagined these Egyptian gods had, they knew that day it was pathetic compared to the true and living God. Now, let's just pause here and apply this for a moment because it's such a disconnect to modern sensibilities. If you're reading this story 
one should not conclude, wow, God is an awfully vindictive God. No, no. One should conclude this, that when God has determined to bring anyone out of Egypt to deliver them from their bondage to sin, here's what God will do. God will expose the false gods in our lives as a sham. He'll do it for you. He'll do it for me. Anything that we're trusting in or depending on that is taking the place of the true God, the living God in our lives, he's gonna expose it as a sham. If your security is in money, he'll show you a glimpse of how uncertain and ephemeral worldly wealth really is. If you're trusting in power as your idol, your God, God may just choose to strip you of power and show you what a faulty foundation is that is to live a life on. If you're trusting in your own wit and wisdom, God will orchestrate a way to show you how the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Anything that is usurping the place of God in your life is a legitimate target for the loving grace of God to undermine and destroy it. That's not vindictive. That's loving. In fact, listen now, listen. For God to allow you to go on trusting in a faulty and false sense of security, it would ultimately lead to your destruction. God would be unloving if he allowed that. So God targets the little gods, the idols in our lives, and he makes them fall away. That's what he does whenever he brings us to himself. And you begin to see it for what it really is. You begin to see that, wow, I've been trusting in idols. I need to focus my life and yield my life to the true and living God. So, hey, I don't know what's going on in your life right now, but if you feel like your life is kind of falling apart, God might be behind it. Just saying. He might be behind a part of the shakeup because if some of those things that are falling away are idols that you've been depending on and trusting in that are not worthy of your trust, God lovingly may be stripping those away to show you how faulty they really are. That's certainly what is happening in this first plague. But now let's go on. I want to talk a little bit about the Passover itself. The Passover itself. I find it interesting that God gave these incredibly specific instructions about the Passover. In fact, as I read it, the details are like, wow, that's, this is really down to the nitty gritty here. And every one of these details foreshadows points to something that's going to come later in the New Testament. I don't have time to cover them all, but let me just give you, just to tease you a little bit, let me give you a few examples of how it foreshadows what was to come later. For instance, the lamb that was to be slain was to be an adult male lamb. Well, guess what? The incarnate Jesus, the lamb of God, was an adult male. The lamb was to be without defect. Well, guess what? That foreshadows or points to the perfect sinlessness of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was without fault, without sin. Even his enemies couldn't accuse him of any sin. They were to eat all of the lamb, okay, and not leave any of it behind. In other words, they weren't to be half-hearted in their meal. And guess what? That points to the fact that we don't just dabble in Christianity and follow Christ in a half-hearted way. We're to be all in or not in at all. And the lamb that was slaughtered, guess, get this now, the, so many details, it's, it's astounding. They were to take the blood and they were to mark the door frames of their houses. And it's very specific with the details. They were to mark this side and this side, and then they were to mark the top, 
And then, and this isn't in the text, but it later was practiced by the Hebrew people. They were to take the remaining portion of the blood that was left over and they put it in a bowl and they set it at the base of the door. Now watch this now. When you apply the blood and you join it, watch this, on this side and this side and then you go up and then you go down, what does that look like to you? A cross, right? It's the figure of the cross, just one of the many foreshadowings contained in the instruction that God gave them. And there are many other details, as I say, we simply don't have time to explore, but they were all fulfilled in detail in the life and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I find it amazing. I find it amazing that after all these details have been meticulously followed and the lamb is prepared, the text we read just a few minutes ago said they were to eat it in haste. In other words, they have the cloak tucked in their belt, sandals on their feet, staff in their hand. It's a sign we're ready to go and move forward in the strength of the lamb at the very moment the word comes, you're free. You're free, it's time to move out. There's a ton of detail. But don't miss the most important detail. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And God's saying, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And it all happened just as has been predicted. All of this is a type of Christ. Christ, Jesus, is our Passover lamb that was slain. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter five. He says, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. When John, the one we call John the baptizer, the forerunner of Jesus, when he saw Jesus coming to him, He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God, isn't that interesting? Every faithful Jewish person who heard that today knew exactly the implications of that because they'd grown up celebrating and observing Passover. And they understood the symbolism of the Lamb being sacrificed and how they could be saved and set free from sin and all that destroys them. Now, that symbolism of the Lamb continues big time in the book of Revelation. Hey, if you got a Bible in your hand, it's that last book in your Bible. Can I tell you something about that last book in your Bible? This is just for free on the most important sermon that I've probably ever preached, that last book in your Bible, 99% of the people don't understand what that's about. Woo! To begin with, they call it revelations. 99% of the people. It's not revelations. It's not plural. It's the revelation. What's it a revelation of? the lamb, and if you read the revelation and you miss the lamb, you've missed the point. You've missed the point because some 30 times in the revelation, it refers to the lamb. Most people read that book, they think it's about tank movements in the Middle East or some political intrigue or interstate highway systems, or something like that, has little or nothing to do with that kind of stuff. The lamb is the point. And he's first identified identified here in chapter five in a loud voice they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And just a little bit later in chapter seven, We see, then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where do they come from? I answered, sir, you know. You know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white 
in the blood of the lamb. That you wash something in blood, that's gross. It doesn't make it white. But in this symbolizing, in the symbolism here, Jesus' blood is applied and it forgives all our sins. And this is a symbol of people who've been forgiven. The lamb is all over the revelation. Later in chapter 12, he talks about how we overcome the devil, our arch enemy. It says they overcame him, how? By the blood of the lamb. There it is again. And by the word of their testimony. The only legitimate means by which our sins can be forgiven and we can be set free to our bondage, from our bondage to sin and walk in true freedom is by the blood of the Lamb. And so that's a great segue to my final major point. I wanna talk a bit about the application of all of this, this to us. Now, if you haven't drank enough coffee yet, I want you to take another sip or two right now and really <clears throat> make yourself whew, get steadied for this. This is really where it gets important, all right? Why is all of that? Why would I begin this sermon by saying this is the most important sermon I've ever preached? What are the implications of this for you and me today? Our problem with understanding the Passover is that most of us, including me, including me, don't have an adequate understanding of sin and what it does to us. I'm a keep it real kind of guy. Most of us think that sin is this little inconvenience in our lives. I'll tell you what sin is. Sin is just a little inconvenience that keeps me from living my best life now. Oh yeah, I know it can hurt my marriage and my relationships, but really, honestly, it's no big deal. I mean, God will forgive all my mess ups, right? That's his job. And so armed with this flippant understanding of what sin is, armed with this flippant attitude, we say a quick sorry to God and go on our merry way. But what we fail to understand, dear brothers and sisters, what I fail to understand is that sin is a big deal to God. And the main problem in Scripture with sin is not what it does to us, but what it does to God. Now, follow me here. Sin, by necessity, provokes the wrath of God. Sin, by necessity, because of who God is, because God is pure righteousness and pure justice and pure holiness, sin, by necessity, provokes the wrath of God. And that wrath has to be addressed and satisfied. So when God says, I, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, what that means is the blood is a sign, the blood is a sign that judgment had already taken place through a substitute. And the lamb was the substitute that took the place of the firstborn. And so God's wrath in that case had been appeased. And his justice had been satisfied through the death of the lamb. Now, I, I hear, I've heard many people through the years say, Pastor, come on. God's a loving God. God's kind and loving according to Scripture. Why did Jesus even have to die on the cross? Why was that necessary? I mean, come on. God's so loving. Why couldn't he just say, look, <laughs> No big deal. You've been sweating your sin. Listen, it's no problem. Let's just forget about it. Let's just start a new day. You're forgiven. Why couldn't God just respond to it that way? What makes the cross necessary is that God's wrath had to be addressed and appeased. Oh. Oh, I know, I know, that is a hugely unpopular statement. 
But the biblical word for that is propitiation. To propitiate means to turn away the wrath by satisfying its demands and requirements. Here's how John the Apostle put it. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That phrase, atoning sacrifice, is translated propitiation in some translations. It means he sent his son to address and satisfy and turn away the wrath of God. Now, let me say it again. I know this is a hugely unpopular message to modern ears. Here's why. Because we don't like the idea of God's wrath needing to be appeased at all. In fact, the very idea of God having anger at all is abhorrent to most modern people in the 21st century. I mean, come on. We prefer, my God would never be like that. Well, my God doesn't have any anger. That's the problem. He's the God of your imagination, not the God revealed in Scripture. We prefer a stereotype. I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm talking about all of us. We don't like that. I wish we didn't have to mention that. We prefer a stereotype of God as a dear old grandfather figure with no emotions that we perceive as negative whatsoever. Now, let me just tell you the problem with that. If that's your view of God, you're gonna tend to sentimentalize the cross and conclude that Jesus was simply dying there as some sort of heroic display of his love for us, uh, just a nice moral example and nothing else. And that's not an adequate view of his death. It was far more than that. The main reason Jesus died on the cross, I know we're in deep weeds here. I know this is deep going. Stay with me. Just another shot of coffee may help you through, all right? The main reason Jesus died was to satisfy the wrath of God against sin. Jesus' death paid the penalty that God's justice demanded and required, and that's why Jesus cried out from the cross, tetelestai, paid in full, justice has been met. That's what he meant. Justice has been met. So the blood of the Passover sacrifice was primarily for God. Oh, it benefited the people too, but it was not primarily for them. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. It was primarily for God. Now, now, hey, let's have a little fun. Let's let's suppose that an Israelite family had said, well, that's gross to me. Hey, we're more progressive than that. You know what? We don't like all this nonsense about putting blood on our door frames. I mean, that's gross. And to be honest, Moses, we don't even like to think about God being angry at sin at all. That just doesn't make us feel good. So we're not gonna kill a lamb and we're not gonna engage in all this gore and sacrifice because we're just not into that. Thank you very much. What would have happened to that family when the death angel came through Egypt, their firstborn son would have died? The lamb was the substitutionary atonement for the firstborn, just as Jesus' death on the cross is a substitutionary atonement for us. So why do we need the cross? Why do we need it? The righteousness and holiness of God demands a cross. Sin must be atoned for. And Jesus died the death that I deserve to die on the cross. Now, you ask in these final minutes, how do we know it was enough? How do we know that his death was an acceptable sacrifice? Good question. Answer, because God raised him from the dead. That's exactly what the apostle Paul teaches in Acts 17. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Yes, there will be a judgment, 
and people will be acquitted or condemned based not on what they've done, but rather on whether they've embraced or rejected the finished work of Christ at the cross. So I gotta ask you, have you embraced the finished work of Christ on the cross or have you rejected that? How would you answer that for yourself right now? The resurrection has many important implications, but one of the most important is that the resurrection proved that God the Father had accepted the death of Jesus. John comes along later and says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So the blood of the lamb at the Passover was a foreshadowing of the blood of Christ. And God says to you today, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. You will be spared, in other words, from the just wrath of God. I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, but I just want to tell you the truth of Scripture. Every one of us right now, Rex Keener, everyone listening to my voice, this moment, We stand in one of two categories. We're either under the blood or we're under the wrath. <laughs> we're either under the blood or we're under the wrath. I know, oh, oh, I, but oh, I wanna, I, I don't want a God with wrath. Sorry, it, go create your own universe. can't just go changing the message because it doesn't make you feel all gooey inside. We're talking about the truth here. We can't just change that according to how we feel. When I was growing up in church as a kid, we sang a song that said, would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Yes, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Are you under the blood or are you under the wrath? This is the most important message I've ever preached in my life because it's the essence of the gospel. If you, in your heart, can never say, you know, I've never come to Christ by faith and said, Jesus, thank you that you are the Lamb of God who uh, took the wrath of God for me who satisfied the justice of God for me so that I wouldn't have to be punished. If you've never done that, why not now? If God the Spirit is drawing you right now, you can say yes to Jesus. I embrace, I accept by faith your finished work at the cross when you died as my substitute. This is the gospel, friends. If you've never done that, I invite you to pray with me right now. Would you bow your heads, please? Let's bow our heads together. I would invite you, as the Holy Spirit has prepared you for this incredible moment, right now, you say to God right where you are, oh, Lord, I accept what you did for me at the cross. As the adequate payment for all of my sin. By faith, I place my trust in you. Please forgive all my sin. 
and let the blood be applied to me. Let the blood be applied to me because there's power in the blood. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for adopting me into your family. Now, Father, I pray for all of those that you've been moving and wooing and drawing. You've been putting away the idols in our lives that, are, that we're depending on. They're all a sham. They're all false. They're not an adequate foundation. And you've brought us to this moment by your grace. It's such a, you're such a loving God to do that. We thank you. Thank you for those that you've drawn into your family right now, into a relationship with you by your grace. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give God thanks today for his goodness. Let's give him thanks. Amen.